Welcome. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, and whatever you have done or failed to do, welcome to this place where we celebrate the love of God and are inspired by the hospitality of Jesus Christ. May you find God's love, peace, and grace as we worship together. I would ask you now to please sign and pass and return the blue attendant pads. And if you don't know somebody, read it so you can greet them. Okay? Now I want to draw your attention to the following announcements. As you've noticed, we have a new agenda. All right? We're starting with the announcements. Our 180th anniversary is February 10th, 2019. The same day as the chili cook-off, which ought to make everything taste good. And make sure you sign up on the easel in Ehrman Hall on the south side. The annual meeting of the congregation will be January 27th. Make sure you sign up for the potluck that will follow. There is an easel by the coffee pot to sign up. And make sure you stay here for the congregational meeting to follow. Or I should say the meeting of the congregation, correctly stated. Today, after the service, bring your coffee into the chapel to join into a discussion about Christian education and Sunday school. We need your ideas and input to make financial and program decisions for now and the future. Now, turn off your cell phones and prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we listen together to the sacred music played by Alejandro. Take it away, maestro. And now let us call ourselves to worship. Please join me. Let us meet God in this gathering. We gather together to praise God, to offer our hopes, to hear again God's call, to strengthen our faith. God calls us to honor all persons, 
be kind to our neighbors, and to praise God's holy name. Let us utter God. Please be seated and let us pray together. Holy God, we pray for your blessing on the church in this place. Here may the faithful find salvation and the careless be awakened. Here may the doubting find faith and the anxious be encouraged. Here may the tempted find help and the sorrowful comfort. Here may the weary find rest and the strong be renewed. Here may the aged find consolation and the young be inspired through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us call ourselves to confession. Please join me. Faithful God, we confess that we do not always be faithful to you. Your requirements of us have been to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Yet, we conform to the lower standards of our world and forget the demands of your call to us. Steadfast God, give us strength to be people you have created and call us to be a holy people abounding in steadfast love and justice. Amen. Hear the proclamation of our gospel. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you're forgiven and be at peace. Know that the spirit of the risen Christ inspirits you and rejoice. Alleluia. Amen.
seated. Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen.
Suddenly I feel so all alone. <laughs> Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the familiar parables of Jesus, at least a few. Listen for the word of God. Jesus began to teach beside the lake, and such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the lake on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seeds fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. He said to them, Let anyone who has ears listen. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about his parables. He said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look but not perceive, and may indeed listen but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. Then he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown, When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a little while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, they fall away. The others are those sown among the thorns. Those are the ones who hear the word But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. These are the ones sown on good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. He said to them, Is a lamp brought into a house to be put under a bushel basket or under a bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. He said to them, pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. For those to those who have, more will be given, and from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. For the earth produces of itself, first the stalk and then the head and then the full grain. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. When I write sermons, I try to begin by asking the so what question. So what difference will this make in our lives? Will this make us more Christ-like? I asked that question to a Bible study group a few years ago, and one of the members answered, it is to learn some truths 
that will help me live a more faithful life. To learn truths, to live a more faithful life. I like that answer. Jesus said he would send the Spirit who would lead us into all truth. Truth about this world that God has created and continues to create and sustain and redeem. Who you and I are as people created in God's image and redeemed by Christ. And how you and I are to live in this creation of God's. With the purpose of gaining truth for living more faithful lives, let us look for the truths in today's parables from St. Mark. Jesus taught in parables. And before we look at the parables of today's readings, first one to answer the question, why did Jesus use parables? Well, first, because parables require effort. The person who wants truth spoon-fed to them, just tell me what I have to believe, I don't want to have to think that hard, is going to find Jesus' parables frustrating. Because even when the point of the parable seems obvious, there is always more truth to be discerned beyond the obvious. And parables invite us into the story. We are invited to see ourselves in the characters and the actions of the parables. And each time we read or hear a parable, we may find ourselves identifying with a different character or part. When I was much younger, I identified with the younger son in the parable of the prodigal sons, because I am a youngest son. Every now and then I would identify with the older brother. That was much harder. I had older brothers and I knew what they were like. But now, as the father of grown children, I find it easier to identify with the father. Knowing that there is always more truth to discern every time we dig into Jesus' parables about God's kingdom, we will not see everything the parables have to teach us. But we gain some truths, enough to be faithful. The first parable, the parable of the sower, our attention I would guess, is usually drawn to the types of soil. The path, the rocky soil, the soil with thorns, and the fertile soil. And we'll get to that in a minute. But it is the action of the sower that would have surprised Jesus' listeners. Seed is precious. And a sower would never waste seed on any soil that was unlikely to be productive. The land of Palestine is full of stones. A New Testament professor I had said that the legend was that God bundled up all the stones for the earth and put them in two bags and had two angels sent out to scatter the stones. But one of the angels, as it flew over Mount Sinai, caught the bottom of the bag on the mountain and ripped it open and all the bags fell right there in Palestine. And that's why it's so rocky. Any fertile patch that they had would have been cleared of stones by hand over the course of years and generations. And as farmers turned up the soil to plant or to cultivate and ran into a stone, they would dig it out by hand and then add it to the stone wall that surrounded the field that would keep the animals from coming in and eating the tender plants. No sower would waste seeds on packed ground or an area already full of weeds and stones. And yet, that is exactly what God does. The types of soil represent our hearts. Some of us have hard hearts. And some of us are shallow. Some of us are distracted by many things. And some of us have open and receptive hearts. That's how we usually read this. Actually, a better interpretation is that all of us are all types of soil at different times and about different things. Sometimes we can be hard-hearted, and sometimes we can be quite receptive and attentive, and then the next minute totally distracted. God scatters truth and grace to all of us 
all of the time. Where you and I might decide that a particular person or group of people is not worth the effort, God does not. God never gives up. God never believes that any of us are hopeless. So the first lesson is that God constantly wastes time and effort on all of us, even when we make ourselves least receptive. As C.S. Lewis once said, human beings are the people who can make them, try to make themselves stupider and often succeed. But there's a second lesson. While soil cannot change itself, we can. We don't have to be hard-hearted. We don't have to be shallow. We don't have to be distracted by cares. And we can resist temptation so that the seed of God is not wasted on us. We can grow in attentiveness and perseverance so that God's root, God's word can take root in us. We can be fertile soil. The parable of the lamp under a basket. The first truth is that truth will out. Nothing is hidden from God. Not our true character. Who we really are is known to God and will be revealed eventually to everyone. Truth will out. But the second is that how we treat others will be how we are treated. In the religion of some, you've heard, human sin is that you and I don't show God enough fear and obedience. This has made God angry. God has decided the punishment for the lack of appropriate fear and obedience is death and eternal torture in hell. You've heard that before, hopefully not here. But that is not what God teaches and not what Jesus teaches. Jesus teaches us in this parable that everyone is treated according to how we treat others. God is profoundly fair. The measure you give is the measure you receive. The respectful are respected. The arrogant are ignored. Those who love are loved. Those who practice justice know justice. Recall the words of the Lord's Prayer we pray each week, maybe each day. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. When we bind each other with unforgiveness, we, it's we ourselves who are bound. The parable of the growing seed. This is a combination of assurance and preparedness. God makes the seed grow. There is nothing we can do to make the seed grow once it is planted. You've heard stories of children who are taught to garden, and so they put the seed in, and then they come back the next day and dig it out to see what's happened. We wait. God is the one who makes the seed grow. Like the farmer in the parable, he does nothing while the seed grows. We can rest assured that God's kingdom will come. As the prophet said, the word of God goes forth from God's mouth and does not return empty, but accomplishes that for which God sent it. But we are also to be prepared to play our part when the time comes. We are to be ready to act like the farmer who knows when to put in the sickle and bring in the harvest. When God acted to deliver the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, Moses and the other leaders and the people had to be ready to pack up and leave. The time came. Don't waste the time. Go now. So we also are to be attentive, discerning for when and how we are to participate in the work of God's kingdom. For one, it may say, no, this is not the mission for you. Wait. And for another, the invitation will go out to be a part of the, the Cuban project or helping with education, doing something with youth, and you'll say, now is the time. I'm ready. The parable of the mustard seed, maybe 
our most meaningful parable today. Because the size of the plant is not measured by the size of the seed. The future is not determined by what we have or have not in this moment. Just as the tiniest of seeds produces a bush large enough to hold many birds, so even the smallest bit of faith is enough to bring about great results. Friends, if scripture teaches us anything, read your way through the Old and New Testament, it is that God almost always begins a great work the exodus, the freedom from people from Babylon, the overseeing of the Midianites, begins the greatest work with the least likely people and all the odds stacked against them. Abraham and Sarah are too old to have children and God says to them, I am going to make a great nation of you. You will have so many descendants, the number of grains of sand will not equal them. The call of Gideon, remember the story of Gideon? He's down in the wine press, hiding from the Midianites, trying to carve out some grain and is choking on the dust. And the angel comes to him and says, rise up, you mighty man of valor. Is there someone else here? You know, who are you talking to? And Gideon says, my tribe is the least of the tribes of Israel. My family is the smallest of the families. And my, I myself am the least of my family. Who are you kidding? I have chosen you to lead the army that will throw off the Midianites and reclaim Israel and set it free. God often chooses the smallest, the least, least likely to do remarkable things. This means we don't let the size of our current church school discourage us. In the realm of God, unlike the realm of other worlds, Size is not everything. The parables of Jesus settle us and they unsettle us. They settle us in that they teach us enough about the realm of God for us to prepare and participate in it, to look and see and live into it. But they also unsettle us in that there is always more to learn. We don't get the answers to all of our questions but we get enough to step out on faith. So rejoice, act on the truth you have gained from Jesus' parables, but don't stop digging. Do not settle for a spoon-fed religion. As the best educators among us teach us, the one doing the work is the one who is learning. Amen.
Scripture is not done until it has worked in us such that we cannot but stand up and reach out to others in love and fellowship and in joy. As people created in the image of God, redeemed by the risen Christ, let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. now though we have to write everyone every week Yeah, exactly.
may be seated. We come to our time of offering. As we think about giving, we could be motivated by a sense of duty. We promise to be faithful members supporting the church. We could also be motivated by a sense of need, told again many times what the church needs to sustain itself, to pay its bills, keep the lights on. Today I invite you to think of all the ways that God has touched you, all the ways that God has blessed you, sometimes with relief and liberation and healing and sometimes with challenge, sometimes with a reminder to think again and that you're better than that. Think of all the ways that God has called us, changed us, moved us, blessed us. And then with gratitude and with hope, let us bring our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray together. We bring you only what is yours, Creator God, that you might use this offering and the giver for the building up of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Amen. Let us stand. Let us pray. As God's people called to love one another, we pray for the needs of the church, the whole human family, and all the world. That churches of all traditions may discover their unity in Christ 
and exercise their gifts in service to all people. We remember especially our sister churches in Racine, the churches in our presbytery, and our partner church, Central Presbyterian Church, Matanzas, Cuba. That the earth may be freed from war, famine, disease, and that the air, soil, and waters be cleansed of all poison. We pray that those who govern may maintain peace and exercise their powers in obedience to your commands, and that those who command great power in business and wealth may also use their influence to bring prosperity to all. We pray that you will strengthen the nations to pursue just priorities so that the races may be reconciled, the young educated, and the old cared for, the hungry filled, the homeless housed, and the sick comforted and healed. We pray that you will comfort and empower those who face any difficulty or trial, the sick, disabled, the poor, the oppressed, those who grieve, and those in prison. Today we remember prayers for Jen Severson, John Reitzma, Peggy Taylor, Ellie Hunt, Mary Johnson, Nancy Ritter, Bill and Lissy Blanford, Ed and Ellie Hunt, Daryl Sutton, Nancy Tobias, David and Kathy Perkins, Larry and Ellen Hardwell, Mary Jane Johnston, and John Brooke. We pray for friends and relatives of our members, Anita, Sean, Mary, Christy, Evie, Autumn, Dave, and Lucille. We remember those also serving in our military, Kyle Sundegaard, Jay Brooke, Chad Lawrence, Jordan Smith, and Mary Workman. We pray for all those, especially federal workers, who have gone weeks now without money and struggle because of the decisions of others. Help us to be mindful and be good neighbors to those we know who could use our help. And now we ask you hear our prayers for our own concerns, which we offer in silence. Merciful God, as a potter fashions a vessel from humble clay, so you form us into new creations. Shape us day by day through the spirit of the risen Christ. And now hear us as we pray, as you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us stand for our closing hymn.
now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forever. Amen.